This is a video in clinical medicine from the New England Journal of Medicine. Evaluation of blood pressure is essential in assessing cardiovascular health. It is used in screening for hypertension and for monitoring the effectiveness of treatment in patients with established hypertension. In the routine outpatient setting, blood pressure is measured indirectly. Thus, it is important that proper techniques be used in order to produce consistent and reliable readings. In adults, a normal blood pressure is less than 120 millimeters of mercury for systolic and less than 80 millimeters of mercury for diastolic blood pressure. Higher levels are classified as prehypertensive asystolic blood pressure between 120 and 139 millimeters of mercury and a diastolic blood pressure between 80 and 89 millimeters of mercury. Hypertension is defined as a systolic blood pressure greater than 140 millimeters of mercury or greater than 90 millimeters of mercury diastolic measurement. The purpose of this video is to demonstrate the appropriate technique for the indirect measurement of blood pressure in adults. Blood pressure should be assessed at each office visit. The equipment necessary for measuring blood pressure includes a stethoscope. The stethoscope should have tubing of sufficient length for the clinician to hear Karatkov sounds while viewing the manometer. The bell side of the stethoscope should be used as it permits better auscultation of Karatkov sounds. A sphygmomanometer consisting of a blood pressure cuff containing a distensible bladder, a rubber bulb, and an adjustable valve, as well as flexible tubing. Finally, a manometer that documents the level of pressure within the cuff. Each part of the sphygmomanometer should be examined on a regular basis. The needle on an aneroid manometer should rest at zero before and after measuring blood pressure. Aneroid manometers should have scheduled recalibration at least every six months. Concerns over the toxicity and environmental impact of mercury have led many institutions to use aneroid manometers exclusively. The steps required for accurate indirect measurement of blood pressure are identical whether using an aneroid or mercury manometer. Correct positioning of the patient is essential to accurately measure blood pressure. The patient's back and legs should be supported with legs uncrossed and feet resting on a firm surface. The patient's arm should be bare to the shoulder. The arm should be supported at heart level. The manometer should be at the eye level of the healthcare practitioner. A common error in taking blood pressure is the use of an improperly fitted cuff. Selection of an appropriately sized cuff requires assessment of the arm circumference. The midpoint position is determined by measuring the distance between the olecranon and acromion processes. The arm circumference is then measured at the midpoint. Once the arm circumference has been determined, the appropriate size cuff can be selected. Cuffs typically are marked with acceptable sizing indicators to facilitate proper fitting. However, it is more important to use a cuff that is appropriately sized for the arm. To assist in selecting the appropriate size, cuffs should be marked with an index line that runs perpendicular to the length of the cuff and a range line that runs parallel to the length of the cuff. The index line should fall within the range line when the cuff is secured to the upper arm. The cuff should be applied two centimeters above the crease of the elbow. It should fit snugly, but still allow two finger widths under the cuff. Next, find the brachial artery, which is palpable approximately four to five centimeters from the medial epicondyle on the anterior surface of the elbow. Place the stethoscope lightly against the skin over the brachial artery. There should be appropriate pressure to ensure good sound transmission. The stethoscope should not be in contact with clothing or with the cuff. Inflating the cuff to some arbitrary level runs the risk of excessive overinflation. To avoid this, determine the measurement of the pulse obliteration pressure. Rapidly inflate the cuff to 80 millimeters of mercury while palpating the radial artery pulse. Continue to inflate in 10 millimeter of mercury increments, taking note of the reading at which the pulse disappears. Then deflate the cuff at a rate of 2 millimeters of mercury per second, noting when the pulse reappears. Once the pulse obliteration pressure is determined, you are ready to measure the blood pressure. 
inflate the cuff to a level 20 to 30 millimeters of mercury above the pulse obliteration pressure. Then, deflate the cuff at a rate of approximately 2 millimeters of mercury per second while listening for sounds. As the pressure in the cuff is decreased, blood flow in the brachial artery increases, creating turbulence, which generates carat cough sounds. Phase 1 sounds are clear, repetitive tapping sounds that coincide with reappearance of a palpable radial or brachial pulse. The onset of phase 1 sounds are equivalent to the systolic blood pressure. Phase 2 sounds are audible murmurs in the tapping sounds. Phase 3 and 4 sounds are muted changes in the tapping sounds that occur as the pressure measurement approaches the diastolic pressure, usually within 10 millimeters of mercury of true diastolic pressure. Phase 5 sound is not really a sound, but rather is the level at which sounds disappear. Phase 5 indicates the diastolic blood pressure. To ensure that diastole has been reached, the cuff pressure should continue to be deflated for an additional 10 millimeters of mercury beyond the fifth Karat cough sound. You should measure the blood pressure twice at a minimum, waiting at least one minute between readings. The average of the measurements should be recorded. In the following example, the patient's blood pressure is 116 over 90 millimeters of mercury. You will hear nothing until the first Karatkov sound appears at 116 millimeters of mercury. The various phases of Karatkov sounds will be heard until their disappearance at 90 millimeters of mercury. An escultatory gap is defined as the intermittent disappearance of the initial Karatkov sounds after their first appearance. This phenomenon can lead to underestimation of systolic blood pressure. Obtaining the pulse obliteration pressure can be helpful in avoiding incorrect measurement. In the following example, the systolic blood pressure will be heard at 162 millimeters of mercury, followed by an absence of sounds for 4 millimeters of mercury, after which they will reappear. Certain conditions may complicate blood pressure measurement or interpretation. In such settings, decreasing the rate of deflation and averaging several readings may improve accuracy. Observer bias is usually the most common error that occurs in blood pressure measurements. It occurs because practitioners often show digit preference and or rounding of the terminal digit. When two people use the same correct technique for measuring blood pressure, there should be little inter-observer variation. Measuring blood pressure correctly is required to classify individuals, to stratify their cardiovascular risk, and to monitor the effects of treatment. This video provides the viewer with a standardized methodology that, when followed, will lead to accurate blood pressure measurement.